Hello and welcome to the next episode, the next lesson of Cylinder Radio. I am your host, William Roosh. I am a high school teacher and I'm very excited for uh, my episode today. Today I have on James Lindsay. He is a PhD mathematician and he is best known for the Grievance Studies hoax papers. Essentially, uh, he is an expert on social justice theory. And this is social justice is something that has come up. It comes up in a lot of uh, the episodes of this podcast. And James has been called the Rosetta Stone of social justice theory. So to really understand what social justice theory is, what social justice, privilege, race studies, all that kind of stuff is, um, I reached out to James and he is gracious enough to come on this podcast. So, uh, so thank you for being here. Yeah, I'm really happy to be here. Happy to talk to some teachers. Yeah, so that, that's, what, that's what we're doing here. So the, uh, essentially, let's talk about where education, especially K through 12 education, um, and teaching social justice kind of, uh, kind of intersect. Um, so two episodes ago, I had on Mandy Manning, and we had a great conversation uh, about the education system. And right away, um, I was thinking about going into unions or about, you know, uh, just the industrial revolution model that, you know, of like bells and things like that. And it went down the road right away of teaching white supremacy. Whoa. And yeah, so I, and I was a little caught off guard. She was, you know, she even like uh, apologized a little bit like, sorry, this is just really pressing. And she is a wonderful educator. She really cares. She teaches um, refugee children and just, and you can see that she cares deeply. So this is in the forefront of kind of her mind. Um, Mandy Manning is 2008 National Teacher of the Year and 2017 National Teacher of the Year is um, Sydney Chaffee, I think I said her name right. And on her website, it says social justice belongs in the classroom. Uh, this is the pinnacle of what we are promoting in high school education. The best teachers are ones who teach social justice. So let's learn about what social justice, social justice education truly is. So James, thank you for being here. Do you want to um, just dive into what, what makes you such an expert? Why are, why are you, if I could have one person on this podcast to explain social justice education, the social justice literature, it would be you. Well, I appreciate that. that uh, I appreciate that. Um, why? So let me talk glowingly about myself and not be awkward about it whatsoever. Are you just uh, super woke? Is that what it is? That's what it is. Yeah, I'm like the most woke. No. Um, so as you, you mentioned that I was, I was maybe best well known for the, the grievance studies, so-called hoax papers, uh, that project that we did. So what we did with that just really briefly was that we wrote a bunch of academic papers towards social justice oriented journals to see if we could make bad arguments with bad ethics and bad methods and crazy data and all this other stuff that shouldn't be able to be published uh, and get them accepted by these significant journals in, or, or even less significant, but some of them were accepted by very significant journals that, that cover topics like gender studies, uh, ethnic studies, critical race theory, queer theory, sexuality studies, fat studies, disability studies, and you can just go on and on. Anything that's kind of like critical something studies was in our purview. And so we spent a year or so doing that, got familiar enough with the arguments to be able to use them faithfully to the concepts and arguments being put forth in that literature. And we're, we're able to write these papers, which then validated that we knew what we were talking about by being published in the academic literature. From that point, which would have been October of last year, or even really we kind of stopped writing new papers um, in, in August of last year, so almost 12 months ago, uh, Helen and I, so there, I had two partners in crime in this, this endeavor, uh, which would be Helen Pluckrose, who's a editor of Aereo magazine and lives in the UK in London, and Peter Bergoshin, who's a professor of philosophy at Portland State University. Uh, so Helen and I, since this all came out, had already kind of decided to start working on a book or she had, and I was going to help her with it. And then this has just become more consuming and I'm now a part of the project uh, to explain where social justice theory came from, how it's evolved, how it gets put into practice. And so she and I continued reading the papers, reading the books in great detail, analyzing the arguments, figuring out essentially the kind of currents within what might be deemed social justice 
theory over the last 50 years and with a focus on the last 30 and then even, even more on the last 10. So we've spent a, another year just completely immersed in the literature and trying to find a way to bridge the gap because everybody recognizes it has really technical jargon. It speaks in a very particular way. It says certain things that people feel like this is something I want to go along with, but then there's this kind of weird feeling like it might have meant something slightly different than what I thought I was agreeing to. And so we're trying to figure out ways to explain what's going on in plain language. And we spent a year since the previous year of digging into it to learn it at research level. And we spent a further year really trying to dig into understanding it to the point where we can explain it uh, in plain language to help people understand what's going on. So like, I guess, like, what's the harm in teaching about privilege and race and gender? Shouldn't we be teaching about race and gender, studying race and gender? Shouldn't, aren't these important topics? Yes. And so the point of our project, which is to write these fake hoax papers to expose the the low standards in those disciplines or or the corruption, really, the political corruption of those disciplines is what we're, we're hoping to expose, was not to just throw a pie in the face of gender studies or race studies or anything like that. It's not to say we shouldn't study gender. It's not to say we shouldn't study issues around racism. It's in fact to say that we should study those and we should do so rigorously. It was to uh, make a call for reform because we figured that those topics are of high importance. They're of high sociocultural and even political salience right now. And they matter if you have people who are being discriminated against or on the wrong side of a disenfranchisement or something like that. There is a need to look into that and to sort out what those problems are, to understand them as clearly as possible, and to start searching for viable potential solutions, test those and uh, the ones that work, refine them and put them into practice and the ones that fail to, to jettison those. And what we saw in the literature is that that is not what was happening. We were not seeing the level of rigor that one should expect. We were not seeing um, the kind of uh, careful, uh, thoughtful approach to trying to get the answers right. We were seeing a theoretical model that had taken over and that the theoretical model, not only does it uh, lack the attendant rigor, having replaced it with a, a kind of a network of rules of what is correct to say or think and what isn't. Uh, but it also openly challenges the value of rigor. There are, there are many calls to say that, that to demand rigor or to use reason over, say, emotion as a tool is, is itself an act of racism. So that, that was um, more than a little bit alarming for us. So our purpose wasn't to, to shame these things out of existence, but rather to make a very public call to say that these these disciplines need to be reformed because these problems do have bases in reality. They do matter. They're important. And what we, we ultimately come down to is that how you approach difficult problems like this matters. If you're getting something wrong or worse, if you're even getting certain elements backwards, or if you're using a theoretical approach that looks good on paper, but doesn't work in reality, then chances are, even in the short term, you might be doing more harm than good. But certainly in the long term, uh, the old saying is reality bats last. And if you're, if you're on you know, the path that's not kind of checking itself against reality, but is just kind of going off in a self-referential theory, it's very easy to get things wrong. Yeah, I mean, before we circle back to actually what this looks like in a high school classroom or even a middle school or elementary school classroom, I think it's really important to recognize that Data and university studies and peer reviewed papers are essentially what we what we build reality on. And uh, my first podcast was with Danny Sisenya, who's a transgendered activist, and he quoted uh, that 27% of the population is LGBT. And I was like, well, Um, I don't know if that, and and he said, well, yeah, that's from the Williams Institute. And I was like, okay, well, I don't know what that is. So I'll look at that later. And then I went into, well, even if it's 1%, but you know, people need to have their rights protected because it's America and blah, blah, blah. But you know, latching Williams Institute is an LGBT think tank. So they, you can structure data to support whatever you want. And now because we all have the internet and we just go on our phone, we can pull this like lack of a better term, this bullshit data. these from these papers from all over the place but you know even when I was talking to um, 
Mandy, she said, just look at the data. Just look at the data. You know, um, black kids are treated much worse for equal, uh, you know, offenses in the classroom. And it's hard because what you guys did with the grievance papers really messed me up <laughs> because I go, oh, well, now if I can't trust academic papers, peer reviewed studies, then then what is reality? Yeah, that's that's actually the crisis that we were pointing at is, is our belief was that there is a crisis of trust uh, in that literature that people weren't aware of. And so we wanted to expose that and and ultimately get to where we could explain how this happened and I mean, maybe we're not the best people. They're professionals that work in different disciplines should be the best people to figure out the next step solutions once things start to reform. But anyway, we can make a call for reform and point out the need for reform. And that's what we were, were hoping to be able to do. Um, the thing is that you're pointing out with, with data is that data are subject to a lot of uh, methodological concerns, as any rigorous scientist will tell you. And I don't want to step way outside of my lane. I'm, I have a bachelor's degree in physics, but I'm not by any means a uh, rigorous scientist. But I do understand enough of the philosophy of science to understand that um, the methods that you use to obtain the data, the definitions that you use for um, the, the data itself, what qualifies as, as a hit in, in this category or a miss or a hit in that other category, all matters. So as a, one of very kind of famous example, I, I mean, even President Obama, when he was in office, put it into action is there is a very famous study about sexual assault and rape on college campuses yeah. that re returned something between one in four and one in five uh, college students is uh, subjected to some kind of a sexual assault or rape. I forget which word they actually used, but then later looking at the definitions that were used, it was a very inclusive broad definition that most people wouldn't recognize that included, you know, things like, touching somebody's arm sometimes without being invited to or you know some weird you know some jerk touching somebody's butt and i can see that that's a problem but to categorize that as a full-out sexual assault or a rape isn't what most people recognize by the word other studies that have used other methods that i don't know but i assume are more rigorous have said that the real number is not something we should ignore it's something like one out of 41 or one out of 45 women but that's a gigantic difference from one out of four or one out of five it's a factor of 10 different um, so when you make definitions that aren't accurate to, to the phenomenon that you're trying to study, or if you use poor sampling methods, or if you use poor statistical analysis, any of those can lead you to get to conclusions. You can look at the data. And if you don't understand how that data was gathered, how it was, what the definitions of the data actually are, uh, how that data was analyzed, then you're going to get yourself in trouble. One of the things, one of the papers we wrote, in fact, we were trying to see what would happen because there's this difference between what they call quantitative data, which uses statistics and numbers and all of this to understand it, and it's considered to be much more firm and rigorous. And then there's qualitative data, which is interviews and things, textual analysis and things like that, that can be very effective, but is also pretty squishy, or it's more squishy in many cases. So we wanted to write a paper to say, to, to show that we were gonna use statistics on this data set we gathered. And the point was that the statistics returned no result, no statistically significant result of any type. And then we were gonna say, but so there's no statistically significant quantitative result. However, the qualitative result shows the following and just overturn the fact that the statistics said there was nothing there and see what they did with it. And what they told us to do was, they, they told us that the, the inclusion of the quantitative data altogether was a waste of time and just to use narrative. And so when you're, when you one of your journals is telling you to throw, I mean, this isn't, of course, a very significant journal, right. but when one of the journals is, when you have a culture, an academic culture that's telling you that if you don't get the result you want, ignore the data and just run on the narrative, then you have a problem. When several of our papers did that kind of thing, we had another paper that was supposed to be about trans experiences in the workplace, and we deliberately cooked it up to where it was based off of interviews with trans people who said they didn't have any problems. And so the point of the paper was that we were going to theorize why they had problems anyway. And they just weren't seeing the problems they were having and that because they've been brainwashed. So even if the narrative doesn't line up, so if the, the, yeah. the, the data doesn't line up, don't worry about it. If the, the, the narrative doesn't line up, don't worry about it. 
Right. And another of our papers intentionally used viciously cherry picked data. It claimed to have had 10,000 minutes of recorded conversations that were being analyzed for their content. And then it only focused on, you know, a very small amount of, of the material that painted the picture that the researcher would have clearly wanted to start, started out wanting to prove. And so when you have a situation like that, somebody can say, look at the data, but if, if that data hasn't been rigorously gathered, analyzed, defined, and so on, um, it can be very misleading. That's why you have back in, what was it Benjamin Disraeli back in the day that said there are three kinds of lies, and maybe it's not Benjamin Disraeli, but I think it was, it said there's three kinds of lies, lies, damned lies, and statistics. And, um, and that doesn't even get into stuff like sampling bias if you're not using, uh, you know, rigorous uh, methods to pick your sample. Um, I mean, there's all kinds of biases that have to come in. And what we saw was that um, a lot of times people who have uh, uh, approach coming, a lot of this stuff's coming out of what's called the theoretical humanities. They don't have a background in science. They don't have a back. A lot of them don't even have a background in social science. Uh, or their theoretical sociologists as kind of the hard, you know, rigorous end of their field. And that's all theoretical. And so they're drawing sociological conclusions without using the attendant sociological rigor. And so there is a crisis of trust there. So look at the data. Well, yeah. what does that mean? Well, if you're, teaching, if you're teaching social science at a university, though, then that kind of by definition, you become a social scientist, right? Well, I mean, it depends. I mean, it depends on what you mean by social scientist, because... Um, what we call gender studies in the United States is called gender sociology in, in Sweden. So you have all these theoretical sociologists, and then you have people like in gender studies who aren't even technically in, under the purview of sociology. They're in, it is a discipline within the humanities that arose out of literary theory. It was yeah. English majors. It was right. not scientists who cooked this up, and they started looking at socially relevant topics. I would encourage all of your listeners, if they can take – it takes about 15 minutes or 20 minutes to read through it. To just go to the Wikipedia entry for cultural studies and read it, yeah. just top to bottom. It doesn't take that long. It's a bit detailed. But what, what's amazing, I just read it recently. I've been meaning to read it for like a year, and I just read it about a month ago. And it shocked me because you think, okay, cultural studies, we're going to study culture. There's going to be different methods, blah, blah, blah. And what it says is cultural studies, and it's like political project, political project, political project, political project, all the way down. It's the whole thing was cooked up to be a political project from the beginning. And so what we wanted to point out was that when your politics lead your research, you're not going to get rigorous results. You can only have politics be your political conclusions be downstream of research if you want it to be rigorous. So that was our, our, our big concern. And I think that's what we've exposed is going on there. Yeah. Um, just going back to when you said that, that sexual assault study, um, I remember Christina Hoff Summers was talking about it and it's not one out of five. It's more like one out of 40 um, because there were, yeah, like you said, there's questions like, have you been, none of the questions were, were you sexually assaulted, I believe, but it was like, how, did you get drunk and then regret, have sex and regret yeah. it in the morning, stuff like right. that. But what I think is really important, this goes for like statistics on police and the minorities, all that stuff, is one out of 40 is terrible. Like it's that's not good. really bad that we need to, we, we can, we need to fix that and focus on that. It doesn't need to be fake. It's like right. there's enough bad stuff out there that we can focus on when it comes to race and gender and discrimination that we don't need to inflate it to, to make it seem worse. Like I just think that right. then it becomes counterintuitive. Well, it um, becomes counterproductive too. Think yeah. about it. If okay, sorry, got, yeah, yeah. That's what well, yeah, well, if the problem is one out of 40, let's just say if there's some problem, whatever happens to be, and it's one out of 40 people are, are victims of this problem. That's in some sense an emergency. Now, suppose that you start treating it as though it's one out of four. So that's your resources are being directed toward 36 bogus cases, or maybe they're not even being treated as bogus and you, you're wasting even more resources and, and ginning up at, you know, time and effort going into solving those. And, and at what, what cost, how much damage are you doing to people? You're teaching yeah. young women in that case, maybe to start interpreting things as a very traumatic incident that maybe wasn't as like, you, right. It's almost, I mean, this is why uh, Greg Lukianoff and uh, uh, Jonathan, Jonathan Haidt. Haidt called in, in their book, The Cuddling of the American Mind, called what you see coming out of these kinds of these, the, these initiatives a reverse cognitive behavioral therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, I have friends who are in therapy for, you know, real severe trauma. And when they've showed some of these things, these initiatives to their, to their psychologists, their psychologists start getting angry and freaking out and saying, this is like, First of all, 
the kind of thing only a very highly trained psychologist under very careful conditions should be introducing to deal with if it's going to be related to something traumatic. It's reverse cognitive behavioral therapy. It's teaching people what's called trauma salience and getting them aware, making them think that they've had traumas that maybe they haven't or to focus on their traumas that they have had and exaggerate their importance rather than figuring out how to how to work around those. And then uh, in addition, it's being administered in a classroom setting by non-professionals. So you're not sitting down one-on-one -on -one with somebody you've spent weeks or months getting to know very carefully before you start introducing, you know, digging into their trauma. And you're doing it instead in a classroom of 30 or 50 students possibly. You don't know who you're, to use the word correctly, triggering. You don't know what you're digging into. You don't know what you're unearthing. And it's really irresponsible. Um, this is why kind of one of my big mantras about what's going on is it's not like, oh, we need to get rid of gender studies. It's we need to do gender studies right because method matters. Right. Um, you can't go, you know, one out of four sounds like this total panic and everybody has to dedicate a lot of resources to it. But the other down, you're going to misdirect resources. You're not actually going to solve the problem. You're going to create new problems. And then in the end, you also are going to drastically diminish your credibility the next time, you know, the next time you're like, well, sexual assault on campus is really important. And now all of a sudden you've discredited yourself because you blew it out by a factor of 10. And people are going to say, well, how do we know you're not blowing it out by a factor of 10? Again, it's the same crisis of trust you're experiencing now. Um, it's just a complete disaster not to approach these things rigorously. If you want to solve problems, you've got to try to get them right. Yeah. So I am, I am deep in this world. I mean, I, you know, study this stuff. I try to get through reading these, these papers and things like that. Like, that is, that is, I'm, I'm in it. Can you hear me? Did my mm -hmm. mic go off? Okay. Um, no, you're good. Okay. Um, but I, so when the, when the hoax papers was, was um, kind of released and I heard about you guys, you know, maybe on Rogan or something like that, or on Brett Weinstein's um, uh, YouTube or something like that. I was like, oh, oh my gosh, this is awesome. It was almost like when in the 90s for, I think a lot of the black community, especially in like South Central LA, when the Rodney King beating came out. Uh -huh. Like, see, we told you we weren't lying. Cops are beating yeah. the crap out of us day in and day out. Woohoo! Finally, evidence. This is right. this is so good. And then what happened was the cops weren't charged with anything, and they're like, "Oh, this doesn't matter. Oh, this doesn't matter." And I and I brought up these papers with so many colleagues and people who are you know are very progressive, and it's startling how just the way it can. Just go from one to another, skip around. Like, well, the journals that they got accepted to weren't great journals. Or, well, mm -hmm. it's not fair because of this. Or, but like, there's just so many reasons to just find holes in it that it, it doesn't matter. Right. That, that was really frustrating for me because I thought that this was a, a starting off point of like, let's study this stuff better. Just like you said, like, let's do this right, but it doesn't seem to matter. So getting in back into the classroom. So why this matters for high school teachers. Okay. Uh, I think teachers by nature, and I can speak for my peeps is, uh, is we, our psychological temperament I'm guessing is, is something that's very empathetic, very open, very like caring, loving, etc. So we're going to assume that if we hear about people who are discriminated against and downtrodden and all this stuff, then we're going to say, Oh my gosh, I need to help them. And mm -hmm. we just, we don't question it. You know, I've asked colleagues, the, like the doubt question that I've heard you guys talk about is like, would you rather cure racism or find truth? And they say, many of them say cure racism. So oh, yeah, this, yeah. this, this thing, it, it comes up all the time. And uh, so my question is like, uh, so one example, like teaching privilege is the, the, the basketball or step forward move. And I did this a couple of years ago. You line up all the kids and then you say, if you have two parents in the household, take a step forward. If you have this, mm -hmm. take a step back, blah, 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 blah. And at the end you shoot a basketball and you say, well, you guys are, have a lot of privilege and you guys don't. So like essentially what is the harm in teaching that? What is the harm in teaching Kimberly Crenshaw and intersectionality? What is the harm of teaching white fragility and um, <laughs> Ron D'Angelo? Like, isn't like, that's, I think, the most important thing that I want to hear your take on. And this isn't easy, but I think, and for, you know, teachers listening. Right. So you asked about, what, yeah. you may not realize, but you asked four kind of separate okay. questions at the same time. I so did. I'm, just, I'm shot out of a cannon, Jim. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, you're good. You're good. Um, so the step forward, step back game, yeah. 
which we actually put in one of our papers. We're familiar with how this, this, this operates. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, I'm not a psychologist, so I don't want to speak to the psychology, but I do understand that, you know, this whole relative privation thing where you start getting jealous of one another, you know, I don't understand how making that more salient to people who are already kind of in this, especially young people who are in this kind of, you know, they got their little competitions. They've got their, you know, they're trying to make friendships. It's adolescence. It's awkward. Maybe it's even childhood. It's awkward. And it's like to make them aware of their betters. <laughs> it's, you know, what are you achieving? And then in many cases, what I've been told from other school systems, I don't know if this has happened in any of yours. People write to me a lot though. And it's like, you know, you'll play that game or whatever. And everybody who's, if it's in a basketball court, for example, anybody in front of the half court line now goes to a special camp to be explain to how they're so privileged and they need to change what they're doing. And the people who are behind the half court line go get taught about how, how racism and and other forms of, of privilege are holding them down. And so now what do you do? I mean, you're just inflaming that even further, you know, you're you're teaching people different curriculum and one group you're getting them to try to like break it down to, to, to feel, and these are kids, right? You're trying to get them to, to essentially feel guilty about things that they probably didn't have anything to do with. I don't know that they get to pick how many parents are going to be in their household. And then on the other hand, you're, you're, you're teaching people uh, that, you know, their peers and the entire system in which their peers came from can, can be problematic. And that leads into what's the harm of teaching critical race theory, intersectionality, Kimberly Crenshaw, and we'll come back to Robin D'Angelo and white fragility because it's a little bit different. Um, mm-hmm. So what the problem there is, and what people don't understand, this is what we've spent the last year learning, and it's really been a revelation for us, and it's made it much easier to understand, is that this isn't a thing where these ideas have the normal meanings that everybody kind of attaches to them. And that they, they, they think that, like, okay, somebody's gone woke, they have this fact wrong, they have that fact wrong, they have seven or ten or a hundred facts wrong, and you can straighten them out if you can correct those points. But it's not how this works. This is a totally different worldview. So to understand critical race theory, let's just focus on the one to make it simpler. Mm-hmm. It's extremely important to, to understand what's going on here. Um, you have to under, I mean, the word race, uh, we can actually kind of just presume people more or less understand. There is some challenge there because, you know, biologists talk about population groups and then races are grouped according to kind of fuzzy categories that are low resolution and they're not that good and they change over time. So it's a social construction, uh, validly, uh, seen. And so we kind of understand the word race. We don't have to dwell on that, but the words critical in theory in the word critical race theory, the term critical race theory are actually important to understand. Both of those are technical terms. Critical actually is a method. It was developed uh, in the Frankfurt school. I mean, this is going way back now. This is in the thirties. It was developed in the Frankfurt school, which was a Marxist project. Uh, you have your theorists. If you want to start naming names like Max Horkheimer, he came up with the concept of critical theory. Um, you had Marcuse, Adorno, Habermas, you had these kind of philosophers and what they were actually trying to do was answer the question of how Marx got it wrong. Marx thought, well, the revolution's going to have, the communist revolution is going to happen naturally when people get sick of capitalism, when capitalism goes far enough. Marx actually turned out to be a big fan of capitalism because he wanted it to go far enough to make the revolution happen. Uh, it's an odd way to say he was a fan of it, but it's kind of true. Um, but that didn't happen. So then this school, the Frankfurt School, evolves trying to answer that question, why isn't it happening? And what they realized was that people weren't aware of their oppression under capitalism as they saw it. So they developed a method called the critical method, which they said is um, different from traditional theorizing. The point of traditional theorizing, according to Max Horkheimer, was to Uh, understand the world. The point of critical theory is to point out the problems in the system, whether you understand it or not, so that people will want to overthrow it. So it's a direct call to the revolution of the system. So anywhere you see the word critical, and I know I sound like I might be wearing a tinfoil hat instead of headphones right now, but that's actually the roots of that word are that, that critical means that you are going to start, your, your job is to pick at an existing system to find its problems such that people will want to overthrow it or reject it to make people feel unwelcome or, or like that system is utterly failing. So you're talking about, this isn't a, like, let's find the problem so we can fix them. La la la. This is, we are going to make people hate the system. So they want to break it and erect something new from the ashes. That's critical. Jumping now, into it with that agenda. 
Yes, that, that's, that's a starting point. And, and again, if you don't believe me, just look it up. I mean, that's really what the root of it is. And this got adapted by the postmodern theorists and it, the postmodern theorists kind of expanded it from capitalism versus, uh, well, just capital picking at capitalism to kind of every walk of society where anywhere oppression can live. Um, a lot of how I got into education was in the 70s, I think 74 or something like that, maybe 71, Paolo Freire picked it up and wrote a book uh, about critical pedagogy. I think it's called Critical Pedagogy. This got expanded on the 1990s by Bell Hooks with Teaching to Transgress. So it was like, if you want to make education be about social justice, you have to transgress the boundaries. You have to make people uncomfortable about their their identity in, in this. But it, particularly, you mentioned Kimberly Crenshaw. She's, the, in a sense, the founding mother. There's her 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 PhD mentor, uh, Derek Bell, would have been the founding father of uh, critical race theory. And uh, Kimberly Crenshaw said that it was explicitly the point was to take the, the, the critical method and, and use it in a postmodern context that's, that's just trying to take apart how things are used in language, how things are represented, uh, images, symbols, uh, discourses, how things are spoken about, and to, to, use the, to use the critical method on those power dynamics between uh, racial categories. So to put social significance into racial, racial categories on purpose, to increase the social significance of I am black or I am Latino or I am Asian or I am white or whatever, although probably not so happy about the fact that I am white gets increased. And um, to do that for the purpose of doing identity politics. So this is what critical race theory is for. Now theory itself is yet an, another thing. Theory is a capital T proper noun. Theory is the view of the world that oppression is, is underlying and real and it's mediated through how we produce knowledge and justify concepts and agree that we will and will not speak about things. And in some sense, if you trace it back um, to the way Michel Foucault, the great post, Mr. Doctor postmodernist, kind of blew it up um, and, and defined it, the idea that he had was that Come, comes down to ba basically to like people can say stuff and some people are going to be considered legitimate and some people are going to be considered crazy at the most coarse understanding. And so that which is considered legitimate became the concern when it's spoken. And Foucault said that's the seat of all power. And so theory is this political project uh, that literally exists to understand that knowledge is a local provincial thing to a given culture. There's no access to objective reality. There's no such thing as objective truth. There's no possibility except by accident that two cultures would agree upon some fact about the, or some truth about the world. And there's no way to compare one cultural point to another. They're actually epistemically islands that are separated from one another. And then the politics comes in by saying that this generates oppression and that oppression needs to be identified and dismantled using critical methods. So when you have critical race theory, the fundamental assumption, and again, and I'm happy to provide the link for this so you can show this Robin D'Angelo, Heather Bruce, and a handful of other uh, educators, a very influential conference a few years ago in Puget Sound, talked about the, the underlying tenets of critical race theory, and they start with the assumption that racism is everywhere, and racism is always, racism is permanent, racism is imminent, it is there. One of the statements they make is the question is not, did racism happen? The question instead, because of course it did, the question instead is how did racism manifest in this situation? So if you're going to adopt critical race theory, you're going to start with the assumption that racism and white supremacy are operating there. And the critical point is, the critical part is our job is to find it, point it out, inflame it, and make people mad about it so they want to get rid of it. So that's actually what you're importing. It is a worldview that accepts as a fundamental premise that white supremacy and racism exist, are imminent, or are, are a crisis that can only be fixed by overthrowing the entire system. That's kind of its own emergency when you understand what they're actually talking about. And I know I sound like a nut job saying it, but I can provide sources for all of this very easily. Um, um, okay, I believe you could. Okay, here, here's, I think I'm, I'm coming on something here. Uh huh. You just laid it all out. Uh huh. Um, Okay, <laughs> I could picture all of my very progressive teachers just glazing over as you explained in detail why this is a problem, what you, you take this stuff too seriously, James. You take this too seriously. I talked to, mm -hmm. um, 
I talked to someone who is the chief of curriculum for a major, major um, so social studies um, website uh -huh. uh, uh, um, for education. And in the conversation, uh, they told me like, oh, it's kind of like Foucault. And, you know, I, I think intersectionality and postmodernism, it's just like a thought exercise. It's just kind of cool to think about. Mm -hmm. um, like you just broke down all of these details, all of these specifics. You've read this stuff. You've spent hours and hours and hours reading Kimberly Crenshaw and Robin D'Angelo and Foucault and all of these. Uh -huh. And I think what is happening is many educators, many people who buy into this have not. They have nope. not. And they just no, assume they it's, this is, James, I, I, yeah, don't, no, no. I don't know what you're talking about. My, just, my head hurts. Just no, racism no. exists, James. Just stop with all the, 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 right. the information. Okay, it just exists. How can, you, how can you possibly believe it doesn't exist? And you were explaining. <laughs> but, but do you see what, this is where I see a big disconnect. Yeah. I see a big disconnect. And when I say, explain this to me, you do. And <laughs> then I go, I, I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. Maybe so it I, helps if we cover an analogy that will step out of their progressive bubble. So I okay. grew up and I still live in the Southeast. I'm not unfamiliar with, um, I wasn't ever a Southern Baptist, but I'm not unfamiliar with Southern Baptist mm -hmm. theology. So Southern, Southern Baptist theology begins with the premise that God exists and God created the world exactly perfectly. And then it's sin entered the world and there's a fall. And the way that they see that and the way that they explain that theologically is that they say that we live sort of in two worlds at once. There's the high spiritual world and the low mundane world that we live in. And uh, the way that they theologize that is that the spiritual world is, in a sense, the real thing. And then the mundane world is the, well, where we live is actually subordinate to that. And so they have this absolute conviction that God exists, God is perfect, God created the world in an exactly perfect form, and they can start, you know, they can cite as many theologians as you want going all the way back to, you know, the second and maybe even first century to back all this up. And then when they start doing that, the impulse from the outside is to say, you know, I just know God exists. I don't need all of these details and all of this. But when these people, especially the ones who are pastors, the ones who are theologians, the ones who are deeply invested in it, when they approach the world, they legitimately approach the world that way. So they meet somebody who, say, doesn't believe in God or doesn't believe in what the, the theology that they believe in, so even maybe a Catholic. And um, their, their reaction literally begins with something like, well, okay, so all knowledge is grounded in God, and you don't believe in God or don't believe in God correctly, so how is it that you can claim to know anything? Okay, so right. when you're outside of that, you're like, what? You know, it's just absolutely confusing, because for them, all knowledge is grounded in God. The worldly the things you know in the world, in fact, the worldly philosophies are considered a distraction uh, and a, a temptation and a confusion, and all knowledge comes from the theology of God, which is rooted in Scripture, and Everything is subordinate to that. So if you don't have connection to the source, which they say is mediated through the, the sacrifice of Christ, if you don't have connection to that source, then you absolutely can't actually have knowledge. And this is what, you know, nobody can understand this. Right. But you actually have to spend time understanding the theology to figure out where they're coming from and then be able to talk across that boundary. This is the same thing that's happening. Rather than believing that the world has begun with God, it's that the social system that we live in was born out of white supremacy. You see this in that 1619 project from the, started at the New York Times. The, the founding premise, the entire fundamental operation, not the America's original sin, but the foundation of American society is slavery and racism and white supremacy. And the view from that position is because privilege and power are self-justifying and they create the knowledge producing system, not intentionally necessarily, but to exclude the perspectives outside of that which is dominant, they don't have any mechanism to correct from within. So if they started white supremacist, they're always going to be white supremacists because there's no means from within to correct it. And the revolution hasn't come yet. And this can be, if you want to look at Christy Dotson's 2014 paper where she compares, it's about tracking epistemic oppression. Um, 
she compares this to the Plato's cave and allegory and expands it. But she, this is actually what's described by Christy Dotson, who's a feminist, black feminist epistemologist who has massive influence right now on, on pedagogy, so on education theory. And, and her, her view is that this is an element of what's called a third order uh, epistemic oppression, which is what she calls irreducible, which means that the epistemic resources are not available within the system to be able to correct it. Audre Lorde more famously uh, phrased this that the master's tools cannot dismantle the master's house um, in a 1979 essay. So this is a concept that's been floating around these circles for four decades from Audre Lorde, if not before her from anybody. And I mean, even what Audre Lorde's exact statement there in there was, besides the master's tool sentence that's so famous, is that if you're going to speak from a position of a racist patriarchy, how is that possibly going to dismantle patriarchy? Because you're speaking from within the problematic system, as Christy Dotson would phrase it, which doesn't contain the set of epistemic resources necessary to create change within that system, while it th continues to marginalize and exclude other perspectives, which would be the emotional responses, the lived experience, and so on that you so often hear people appeal to. So what I would tell people who want to just put their hand to their head and say, this is too complicated, it's not really like that, is yes, it really is like that. This is an entire worldview. This is a worldview that was born in the postmodern conception that drew upon the previous uh, the critical approach to fuel what it was doing to try to uh, despair about how power works in the world. That's what the postmodernists were ultimately doing. They were despairing about how power works in the world and corrupts. It is an entire worldview that begins, and it, the parallels even to religion are insane. Um, privilege actually is almost a perfect parallel to the Calvinist concept of total depravity. Total depravity, for those who don't know, is a, um, is a theological point that says that human beings are corrupted by the want to sin. And it's total because it touches every part of their life. Well, the theor uh, privilege is theorized as when you have privilege, um, you, you act in subtle and, and sometimes overt ways to, to preserve that privilege and to work in its best interest or in your own selfish interest. So you have concepts like Alison Bailey. This is in a paper about education. It was published in Hypatia, which is a very significant feminist journal that's very much paid attention to. She called it privilege preserving epistemic pushback. When people are challenged on their point of privilege, they tend to push back because they don't want to engage. Robin DiAngelo is probably the queen of this, but there are a dozen other theorists. Charles Mills with the racial contract, um, Barbara Applebaum with white ignorance and color talk, uh, Jose Medina with active ignorance, well, it becomes uh, a perfect circle, right? Like it, you it, can't it, challenge it because, and if you challenge it, it proves me right. That's so, white fragility yeah. in particular. Yeah. White fragility is the perfect uh, setup, like like you see in Kafka's novel, The Trial, uh, where Joseph K is uh, accused of things, and when he denies it, it's his denial is taken as proof of his guilt. So Robin DiAngelo's concept of white fragility, you don't have to read very far into her paper. I, the book you do have to get a little bit more into, I guess, but in her 2011 paper titled White Fragility, where she originated this concept, it's the first paragraph. You can just see it, that if you uh, are confronted with the fact that you are participating in a white supremacist system, which critical race theory assumes from the bottom, it starts with that assumption and looks for proof everywhere. That's the project there. That's the worldview is it's there. We just have to find it and make it more clear. But if you get confronted with this and you disagree, you become emotional, you go away, you, you lock down and sit in silence, you try to ignore it, if you take any of these approaches, then you fail to engage with the material because you don't have, and I quote, the racial stamina to do your anti-racism work as you need to. And this she called white fragility, which she said is born out of the everyday experience of privilege is that white people are one of the points I mentioned before in that critical race pedagogy uh, talk from a few years ago with D'Angelo and some others again, was that anything uh, that, that white people are comfortable in a white supremacist or racist system. So anything that maintains or, or perpetuates white comfort must be suspect. I mean, these are the premises that are, that are underlying this. So with, with white fragility, you have one option, which is to agree 
And if you don't agree and enthusiastically agree and choose to do or volunteer to do the anti-racism work that's prescribed and the method prescribed, then you're just exhibiting fragility and you actually are proving that you need the, the work done. It's There's no escape except to agree. You see this again in Barbara Applebaum, who I mentioned in her book, um, being white, being good, which is about complicity with racism, whether intentional or not. She mentions that the only form of legitimate disagreement with social justice work is to ask questions until you understand it so that you can agree. Right. That's not disagreement though, <laughs> right? It's asking clarifying questions with the intent to agree. So when you've got a system that first of all, assumes the thing it's looking for at the bottom, which is what critical race theory does, and then uses methods to where there's absolutely no path through this except to say that it's correct. What you're dealing with at this point, I, we talked about rigor a few minutes ago. This isn't even a lack of rigor. This is, uh, this is something way beyond a lack of rigor. It is, it's, a, it's the same kind of worldview you see in Scientology. Right, yeah. Um, okay, so- And so what's it, the harm of teaching that to your kids? I mean, just what's the harm, right? There you go. So that's, that's exactly what I, what I was gonna get to and that I think is really important because you know, about the 1619 Project, I talked to some colleagues about that and one of the responses I got was like, well, I don't agree with all of it, but you know, it's, it's bringing awareness. You know, at mm -hmm. the very least, we're just, we're, it, it opens a conversation and that's something that gets said a lot. You know, it, it opens a conversation and we should be talking about this and yeah, we should be talking about it. It's good to have a conversation, but it's the, it's the foundation. Again, when you take it seriously, would you, I have never seen a real like debate or, or conversation, or I guess I call it debate between, you know, the people you mentioned and, you know, the people who are more critical of it with you, won't. you, you Helen, Peter, you know, Jordan Peterson, Sam Harris, whatever it's, yeah, they, That'd they be just theoretically not against the rules. And in fact, Robin yeah. D'Angelo refuses to do it, for example. Um, why is it theoretically against the rules? Because this is a worldview that is interested in understanding how discourses perpetuate oppression. So if say you were one of these um, scholars and I invited you to have a debate with me. The only way you can possibly have a debate is by putting a making a platform with me where I get to say my piece about it, which means I get to promote the discourses that they don't want to have promoted. So they, by volunteering to have a debate with me, are theoretically being complicit. And remember, Barbara Applebaum's book was titled, you know, about complicity, was titled, you know, being white, being good. So you have this idea that being complicit in perpetuating the discourses is actually not allowed. So you're not gonna see this debated. It's again, I don't mean to draw, and I mean, this is actually kind of my expertise, but uh, so I will go there, but I don't wanna draw an unfair analogy, but the truth is that, that this is a faith system that's in operation um, where nothing, you're not allowed to disagree with it. And again, what happens if you challenge these ideas? What do you get called? You get called a racist. Mm -hmm. If you think the 1619 Project opens a conversation, good. Yeah, it does. And we should have conversations in a liberal system. If you want to forward the idea, for example, that historically the United States was founded at Jamestown even on slavery, then that's a question in a, in a debate to be had. But who's going to be able to answer that? It's going to be rigorous historians who are going to look into the thing. I got and, one coming on here in two weeks. <laughs> yeah. Good. It, and so, and, I, and I know them well. So yeah. Oh, they're, they're trashing the thing as far as I can tell. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is that becomes part of that dialogue. So the conversation started, the conversation continues. But then when you say, well, one of two things, well, the reason that, that those people are actually speaking from a racist perspective that doesn't want to engage with the material, that would be what Alison Bailey and Robin D'Angelo and so on would and, Jose Medina, I could just name these people. Yeah. Um, that's what the, the state of theory for the last 10 years, most of which is bent toward uh, the classroom, says about this is that, well, you know, they just don't want to engage with the new evidence that's found. Uh, and then on the other hand, the thing they'll say is, well, by, by using more, more traditional instead of rigorous, they'll say more traditional uh, historiographical methods. Um, they're just working from a dominant paradigm that excludes alternative knowledges. So you can't say it's wrong. You're either wrong, you're morally wrong for saying it's wrong, or you're tied up in a system that refuses to listen. There's your Christy Dotson's third order epistemic oppression. It's literally baked together so that it can't possibly be wrong. And so to start a conversation that can't have anything but one conclusion mm -hmm. is not to start a conversation. It's to proselytize. Yeah. So, um, 
okay. Uh, now, just to kind of like wrap this all up, hopefully in like a, like a nice bow is um, each state has different standards. Uh, mm -hmm. In California, it's become mandatory to teach LGBT, um, you know, history. But in Texas, they don't even have on the state standards Jim Crow. Yeah, so, A is for Alamo. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's, it's one of those things where there's like, you know, there are individual standards. I don't think that this issue is is a major issue in all of the nation's high schools. But I do think it's being promoted at the top education universities. So like Columbia yes. School, a graduate school of education. Oh, every one of them. Yeah. So there, and then, every. like I said, the national teachers of the year, the ones who are up for teachers of the year, which are the, what we strive to be. So it becomes that the schools, I, I think in Texas, they should teach Jim Crow. I think that's pretty important. But Sure. But there's, you know, there is something where like these states are just backwards, they'll get there eventually is kind of the aim. So to get back right. to the question, you know, what's I'll the throw in there, by the way, since yeah. you mentioned people at the New York board, state, New York State Board of Regents has taken this up. Uh, mm -hmm. So it means it's going to be core standard curriculum across the board, not K through 12, but K through postgraduate, because uh, yeah. the New York State Board of Education rules everything in, or New York, sorry, New York State Board of Regents is in control of everything of state education. So, you know, Texas is on the one extreme. I don't know, California is somewhere uh, toward another extreme. I just saw another thing about your board of education voting on an initiative for it. And then New York is kind of going like all the way, you know, so it's, well, it's, it's spreading. Yeah, I mean, they went all the way with birth certificates. I mean, that's, and that's to show uh -huh. where this ends up, where now in New York, if in people don't know, you on a birth certificate, you can write male, female, or X. And just, this is so new. Like maybe, maybe it's healthy to not give your child a gender from birth. Maybe, but there's no significant backing to say that's true to the point where it should be policy, I think is just something um, to put out there. But as far as division goes, um, uh, there's some stories. I talked to fellow teachers from different schools um, around the country, actually. And, you mm -hmm. know, stories like I have um, uh, one of the godfathers to my, my um youngest son is gay and he got married and his sister was the efficient and she is a high school teacher and she uh a lot of the the she's had a couple of experiences she's asian she's um uh, south korean but she uh but one of the things was she gave a black girl an f and the girl claimed racism mm -hmm. and so she had to go to a hearing and all that kind of stuff because all you have to do is say it's racism and right. it became a big thing and you right, have to prove now that it wasn't and right, because that's how like, theory operates. Yeah, and she said, like, well, I had to show, like, well, here's your papers, here's where you did bear, and good thing that she's, like, very meticulous about keeping records and stuff like that. Um, no stereotype. But the, uh, but, uh, the other thing was the um, rainbow, uh, all the teachers were putting a little rainbow sticker on their school IDs, and they mm -hmm. said, I won't say her name, but they said, you know, do you want to put one on your school ID? And she's like, no, I don't want to do that. Um, and they're like, well, why not? She's like, I don't know. I just don't feel like the need to broadcast that I, you know, that I support gay people. And, mm -hmm. and she was kind of became a pariah around the school for a while of like, you know, you're a homophobe, you're not supporting this. And she had to be like, look, I married my gay brother. Like, what, yeah. what are you talking about? But again, she didn't support it. So there is a division element of this, that if you don't toe the line, then you are racist, you get called all those things. I think that is a one of the major um, harms of this. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that's extremely stressful and ostracizing. Um, it's also totalitarian, but it's the reason where that comes from is that what, what I was talking about is you've got to speak into the right discourses. This is a worldview that cares about what discourses are being spoken into. And of course they've blurred the boundaries as to what constitutes a text. A text can be something that's spoken. It can even be a physical location. Like a coffee shop can be read as a text and look for the problematics. So the discourse that they were trying to promote the alternative LGBT discourse would be that you're wearing the, the rainbow and to not participate in that discourse by its absence indicates that you are speaking into a discourse that's separate from that. Now the reason doesn't matter. Intention is clearly theorized out. All that matters is impact. So that ties back to the other story uh, that you told from the same kind of uh, the same situation, which is this, this black student who claimed racism. Uh, one of the theoretical points is that intention doesn't matter, only impact matters. So, uh, and the, the ultimate arbiter of truth is lived experience. That is the, the postmodern understanding of knowledge is that one's lived experience, subjective experience is the only thing that you can say 
arbitrates truth and every person gets their own truth. We all have our own truth, but then truths are also located within uh, experiences of oppression. So say there's a black experience and all black people share that experience in common. So there's a tr black truth that goes with that. Um, so it does create the, the, the situation where um, somebody can, Im, you know, the impact I, I feel ra racially discriminated against her. This was a racist act. I experienced racism. There's no possible way to discuss it or, 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 or argue against it. Or, or and luckily there was, you know, enough record keeping to where it could be defended against, but eventually there, there won't be because experience will, will rule over all. And, um, this manifests, you don't want to talk about what the harms are. I mean, there's some obvious harms here, but who's getting cheated in their education here? So I had somebody, I had people reach out to me all the time. I had somebody reach out to me, a black guy who um, had completed a master's in fine arts and his deal with his uh, MFA was that nobody was critiquing his writing because nobody wanted to be called racist. And so he yeah. even realized this was happening and started doing things that were really broken on purpose and nobody would critique his writing. And nobody would correct it. And they'd just give him, you know, A's or B's or whatever. And then when they would have, you know, his creative writing or whatever was this field, I don't know if it's playwriting or something, but when they would have kind of like group sessions, which they often do in creative writing environments where peer evaluation of your writing, there would be, the, if, if there was going to be any criticism given, which there usually wasn't, even though he was intentionally doing like broken plot devices and just nonsense. And uh, there would be this long preamble about how um, this isn't coming from a racial perspective and it doesn't have anything to do with your race. And just let me acknowledge my privilege as a white person before I vote, you know, the whole thing. And it was just so tedious to even be able to get told, you know, you left out a comma or whatever it happened to be. And so his, his complaint to me was, my skills never improved. Nobody ever challenged me. So right. who are you cheating? So if your worry, if your concern is, this is what I was saying before about method matters. If you think that there's a problem with, with racism in the school or whatever, or racial disparities in culture, which are, there are some, then you want to find a method that actually can solve the problem. And, and uh it's all too easy to pick the wrong method and cheat the very people you're trying to help by being uh, too nice to them. You know, in therapy, you talk, or in, in like couples a lot of times or with drug addiction, you talk about people who are supportive and then you talk about people who are enablers. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between being supportive and being helpful. And then there's a line where you cross where, you know, your heroin addicted husband or whatever, and you're buying everything for them and you're taking care of the messes that they make. And you're always cleaning up after the disaster so that they have, they never have to face the consequences of their actions. At some point, there, there's tipping into enablement rather than, uh, than, than doing something that's genuinely helpful. And so if your impulse is to help, as you said, most teachers are, and I think most people are. I mean, I've even talked at this point, I've talked to a lot of people, there's some very profound, profoundly deep conservatives, and the stereotype of them, of course, is that they're callous and they don't care, and that's the threat of deep conservatism is callousness. And even they care much more once you scratch beneath the surface they care much more than anybody anybody would think and they don't want to see these problems in society uh but the way that you're going to approach them really does matter it, if you have to do the best you can to get them right and having a hysterical theory that begins with the whole school is a white supremacist system and if we call any kid any black kid out on you know their math mistakes then that's racist that's a major problem because that kid's not going to get better no Child Left Behind, the big joke, you know, of that, this is like this on steroids, No Child Left Behind on steroids. The joke of that was No Child Gets Ahead. But this isn't going to, as, as is theorized correctly, to give credit to this, you know, kind of literature, they point out repeatedly that when you come up with some system like this that's supposed to benefit anybody or everybody or they could hurt anybody or everybody, climate change is a big one, they could hurt everybody, then the people who get hurt the most are the people who have the fewest resources. So the people who need the help the most by a bad method are going to get screwed the most when, when you apply it. So if you want to help, do something that, that, that's rigorous, not something that's like a moral panic. Yeah, there was a, a Yale study about how people who are more left-leaning um, use different vocabulary. They use like dumbed down vocabulary for mm -hmm. um, people of color. And you know, it goes back to that, I think it was Nassim Taleb, anti-fragile idea of yeah. like, you know, you're just bubble wrapping for people. Like, we're educators. I'm speaking to the teachers now. Like, we're educators. We need to keep high standards. If you believe in discrimination, you believe that this stuff is out there, which it is, that, you know, like how making things easier 
lowering the bar is not it. You have to support them. If they're not coming in with the necessary skills, that's our job. That's what we're getting paid for. We got to give them those skills and help them to be able to jump on hurdles that are equal to everyone else. It's not doing them any, it's not doing them any favors. It's critically hurting them. Oh, yeah, it's, right, right, right. It's, it's actually, it is. Yeah. It's infantilizing them. It's, it's under challenging them and it, 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 it doesn't help. It's, it's a well-intended mistake. I mean, the saying is the road to hell is yeah. paid with intentions for a reason. And I mean, I get the impulse, but you, there, there's all kinds of problems with it. This is why, again, the call was for more rigor and, and, the research that's backing and going into this stuff and uh, to, to, you know, try to use carefully determined methods that can actually look at the real problems with carefully examine and, and uh, analyze data and then start to perform, you know, within the context of the profession. I don't mean like we're going to do some like, you know, Tuskegee thing or whatever, but some kind of an experiment to see, you know, okay, and what kind of outcomes will happen and these situations will happen. And I know there's some of that that's occurring and people would be able to refute this by pointing, well, here's this and here's that. And some of that's going to be rigorous and some of it's not. And the problem is it's very difficult to tell what's what, um, which is why, again, the, the field at the academic level, so your pre-service uh, education schools, uh, teacher education schools are, as you mentioned, completely eaten up with theory now that you, it's hard to tell what's legitimate and what's not. So that has to get cleaned up upstream and then the you know the better materials have to be given to teachers but the message is is if you want to help the how you help matters because you can really screw somebody up by doing it well intended and wrong that doesn't make you a bad person because you're trying to help you have right i don't believe that there's you know that i don't believe it's all impact i think the impact and intent both matter uh in terms of weighing things out ethically and you can be a good person who's making bad decisions uh and then the call to you is to to correct not to is to do something you know try to make it better not to just jump on you know some some bandwagon or whatever that's it's running wild or with, with i mean just think about it for a minute do you really think the entire system is white supremacist and rather than you know some fringe of people are actually white supremacists and we should probably focus on those people as the group that they are develop counter arguments to what they have and make sure that that stays fringe and and, and uh you know marginalized or do you want to do you want to take the assumption that you know basically the entire population is white supremacist i mean what are you what, what are you doing Yes. So to kind of, cause we could talk, I could talk to you all night about this, but I'll take up your night is a uh, look, don't teach nonsense. Teachers right. don't teach nonsense. Even if it's well-intentioned, you can't teach nonsense. Okay. And don't, it's, don't it's, screw up. I don't want to steal your thunder. No. Go, go, go. Oh no, no, I'm sorry. Just, but no. um, just real quick. Now I want, I want to hand it back to you, but the, uh, but even if it's well-intentioned, you are supporting an idea that is put forth by people who will not defend it. They will not defend it in any kind of rigorous way. They won't go up against you guys to hammer out the peer review system has been shown to be corrupted. Why would you teach something that has not given pushback? You're lifting, you know, these people are lifting weights in no gravity. It's don't teach nonsense. That's the importance. Studying race is not nonsense. Studying gender is not nonsense. These are important things that need to be studied, but the way it's being done is you, we are educators. Let's learn this. I don't know how to like red pill. I, I hate that Candace Owens took that. Concept, yeah. But, uh, but, uh, but I don't want to red pill anybody. <laughs> no. I want to liberal pill them. I, don't, I guess I would be yellow if we went to the traditional colors. Okay. Like, yeah, let's look. Teachers, we are, we are, should be lifelong learners. We say that we want our students to be lifelong learners. The work that, that you guys have done is, it's intense. It's a lot. Okay. But let's, get, let's do a little bit of a deep dive. Go, go do some research. Go in with a critical eye. I love when Heather Hying talked, I'm sure she's not the only one, but she says something along the lines of like, when you have a hypothesis, try to prove it wrong, not try to prove it right. Because if right. it holds up to that, then you got something there. Yep. And I, I love that. And I think that we need to try this. And as much as you might want to believe that, that, that this is true, because it's kind of wrapped up nicely, or as much as you don't want to put forth this effort because it's frustrating and you have the backfire effect and you have this you know, worldview that's, that it's very hard to get challenged. Look, we have a job here as teachers. This is a very important job. 
I take my job very seriously. I love it. I have a lot of fun, but I don't think this is something that should, we should be taking lightly. I don't think that this is something that we should just, just take in a frivolous manner. We need to dive into this. And I hope that people, educators listening will go out and just go, hmm, all right, it's probably nonsense, but, but, but what, what James and Will are talking about, but let's all, 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 all play with this a little bit. I don't know, but that's kind of my, my big push for my fellow teachers out there is just look into it. But why would you teach something that is not held up to any kind of real scrutiny? Like, just think about that for a minute. We don't, we say we're teaching things that are based in data. We always go to data. We go to science. We're educators. This is not, this is not. And that doesn't mean that we, you have to risk being called a racist and a sexist and a homophobe, but we're not. It, it's the opposite. We want to really understand race and how it plays out in America. We want to understand gender and how it plays out and trans, the trans experience and all that kind of stuff. We want to know that, but we have to do it honestly and we have to do it in a way that is not going to lead to a lot of the stuff that we're seeing now in society and policy and stuff like that. This is a, a sort of like I use the word, but it's a critical time for our country right now. And let's, Let's try to keep the education system honest and let's keep it rigorous and let's keep it something that we can, we can use to actually solve problems, not make problems worse. Okay, that's, that's my <laughs> okay. that, that was okay. epic. That was epic. I love the energy there. That was so good. I didn't want to, I, we got all excited about some silly little thing that had just no. the whole thing. That Absolutely. No, 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 no. No, uh, what I was, I mean, I even thought of something, it was so good. I thought of another thing I wanted to say in the middle of it and it's just gone. Oh, so it's like, you were, you were on a roll. I love it. Um, I love that energy. Uh, one smaller thing though, that I do, do recall of the like two or three things I thought I might say. Uh, one smaller thing there is that, um, you know, you want to keep your eye on the ball. There's a big push to insert social justice within other subjects. And I, I run into this a lot. Um, social justice and math education. I was a math teacher uh, a number of years ago. So I kind of, you know, I'm appalled by seeing this. Uh, the, the purpose of the math class is to teach mathematics. And when, when you're introducing another variable, um, now that's class time that's not going to teaching mathematics. And, you know, mathematics is a hard subject to learn. A lot of students struggle with it. It takes a lot of time. And so, I mean, I always wanted to get a t-shirt that says math is hard, you know, and laugh because my PhD is in that, but um, this is my personality. Uh, but it is hard. And so if you're going to start taking up class time, like these things start recommending to journaling about social justice issues and having class discussions about social justice issues, not about how to use math to sort them out or whatever, but literally about the issues that came up as the example, uh, you know, you've, you've lost part of your path and yeah. education is actually, as you said, it is, it is crucially important. Um, oh, I remember the other big one that I was going to say. And so this it ties right in how perfect. Um, and so when you look at this from the critical perspective and, and then you're using the word critical, you don't have to apologize every time you like, this is a critical time. That's okay. That's a critical that's mass of your premium. That's okay. Um, you know, those are, those are okay uses of it. This is critical thinking. That's actually okay too. It's not the same thing as this specific critical method. And uh, the fundam this is what your, your um, what educators out there should start to, to reflect on. Critical methods like critical race theory uh, begin, critical pedagogy in general, begins with this sentence. And you have to decide whether or not you agree with it or whether you think it's a good idea. And that sentence is education is a political act. If you think that your role as an educator is inherently political, I would strongly urge you to go back and reflect upon what the hell you think you're doing because you're an activist now. And you mentioned Heather Hying. One of the things that Heather Hying pointed out to me uh, last, late last September, right before we went public, is that there's an inherent tension between activism and education because education is by its very nature, an open-ended question, question asking process. It requires you not to know the answers. Activism requires that you already know the answers. You already know what the truth is and you're gonna put it into action. So if you, maybe you do agree 
that education is a political act, but you've got to be able to mount a reasonable defense of that before you're going to put it into, into practice. And if you're an educator who thinks that education should be about learning um, and that maybe the politics is best left out of it, and then if you flipped it over and it was a conservative politics that was taking over, or if they're putting creationism back into the schools, which is a religious point, right. I think right. you'd be really worried about the idea that you would say education is a political act, that's an emergency, or hair's on fire. So when it's the politics you agree with, the, 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 the need to reflect isn't less, it's double. And so think about that. Critical approaches start with the statement, and this is, again, look it up. I'm not making this up. That education is a political act. If you believe that that's what you're doing, I really encourage you to reflect upon that. And if you believe that's not what education should be about, I encourage you, you want to talk about opening a conversation, there's a conversation to open with your fellow educators. Is education a political act? Should it be a political act? Those are some hard questions that we should be grappling with, or I think educators should be grappling with, um, because that's at the heart of this whole thing. Whether we want to talk about worldviews and what you're importing into the school or moral panics or separating kids and screwing them up psychologically possibly because you're using backwards therapy in an unregulated situation, all of those things are one level. Another level is just the, the, the deep, bare bones of education. Is the point of education to politically instill some view in kids? Right. Um, so uh, part of what I'm doing here, and I talked to you about this earlier on the phone, is this is a bit of a bat signal. If what we're talking about here, if you've seen this, if you're a teacher, then uh, the metaphor I'm using is forming Voltron. <laughs> is yeah. the, uh, This idea that we are going to, and I've talked to a couple, there are high school teachers out there that have seen this, that have felt um, when, when they've given pushback, have felt like being ostracized by their, by their um, colleagues and their school and people who have gotten a lot of trouble and stuff like that is please reach out to me. I'm on Instagram because that's the one that is most used as far as social media goes between young people and teachers. And that's my kind of target. So it's at Will Roosh, W-I-L-L-R-E-U-S-C-H or cylinderradio at gmail.com. Um, just want to put that out there. Um, but James, Thank you for doing this. Where can people find you, your stuff, what you're all about? I mostly am active on Twitter where I don't take myself seriously at all. I take my work seriously, but I don't take myself seriously. So it's half kind of like really good points about what we're talking about and half like comedy and don't get too offended by it, I hope. Um, it is somewhat adult humor sometimes, but um, so maybe don't send your uh, students, <laughs> students. To Okay. But at, at any rate, let me add to what you just said about the bat signal before. I mean, cause I mean, you can find me there. That's where you can find me. Twitter at conceptual James, everything spelled the way it normally is. No okay. funny characters. It takes up all the characters. So I couldn't put anything in there like an underscore at conceptual James. You can find me there. Um, but let me add to that bat signal thing. Cause this is a yeah. big deal. This is actually super important. Um, the only way you're going to be able to deal with this problem in education, if you believe it's a problem in education, is by forming a movement. Uh, you are going to have to get together. And there are going to be a few things you need to do. The first thing is half of you are probably going to, more than half of you are going to feel gaslit. Like this isn't really a problem. Every time you talk to somebody, they're like, it's not a big deal. This isn't really happening. It's just, you know, people doing the right thing. You know, it's, you're going to feel weird and gaslit. You're going to feel unable to speak. You're going to be, you don't even probably know where you can start to have these conversations with other educators. You probably don't realize how many of your fellow educators think similarly to you because nobody's willing to be the one to speak out. So if you can kind of gather around, I mean, Will's putting his neck out here. If you can gather around that, you can start to talk to each other. And as I say, you'll find your legs. You'll realize that there's a, there, there are other people who think like you, you're not going crazy. You are not going crazy. This really is a completely weird thing that's taking over kind of everywhere. We're talking about education, but I see it in law. I see it in medicine. I see it in the academy. I see it in the Southern Baptist Convention is falling prey. I mean, this is everywhere. It's in everything. Faith, every profession. You see it at Google. You see it in major corporations, people getting fired. You see the NFL good putting social justice in as like it's one of its agendas. It, Gillette's doing that commercial lost $8 billion. I know there's not exactly what happened, but you know, it's funny that la I laugh about that one on Twitter a lot. Uh, there's, it's everywhere. And so you're probably feeling like you're going crazy and you're not, but you need people who, who see it too, who are willing to speak about it to be able to speak with. So forming a network where you guys can reach out to each other and understand each other and, and realize you're not alone. You're not crazy 
is key. You can find your legs. You can start to gather resources. I will be, my, my team and I are working to produce these resources. We're under a book deadline until the end of this month, but then we're going to start producing more resources where you can start to understand what's happening. Um, and, you know, we're going to aggregate those things in one place, which I don't know where that'll be yet, but we'll let you know when it, when it exists. And so you can start to learn what's going on, work with each other, and you're going to have to try to build a movement around that. And when you have enough people, you have a critical mass of people who are confident to be able to speak and realize that you can support one another. Um, then you can start speaking out about it and doing so from a position of strength instead of his uh, seeming hysteria. So this bad signal build a Voltron thing is super important and realize that, like I said, it's not just happening. It is very happening in education, but it's not just happening in education. It's happening in other walks of life. Um, famously in some knitting club called Ravelry online. Um, there's lots of hiking clubs reach out to me all the time. Uh, governments have reached out to me, <laughs> like actual governments. Um, it's, yeah. it's, it's everywhere. And there are a lot of people right now out there who are like, am I going crazy? And you're not, you just got to start, you know, finding this kind of work. And if you find this, try to support other people who are speaking about it because that support's necessary. I'm not necessarily even saying financial support. If you depend on financial support, give Will money. I'm not asking for it for myself, but, um, reach out and send that email. Like, Hey, I appreciate that you did this. Hey, I, I, I want to be a part of this, you know, to, you know, I want to help that kind of stuff is even just the thank you for doing this from an anonymous account is a big deal, but cause it's so pervasive. So reach out, try to gather together and try to start communicating with one another and start trying to build a movement with an education. If you want to see this go, there's, you're not going to be able to do it as individuals. You've actually got to start building a counter movement. This is a well-organized thing that's been operating on it, schools of education since the 1970s. And we're just seeing the, the fruit coming to bear on the tree that was planted 40 years ago. So um, definitely try to organize and, and un get in touch with one another and support each other. Thank you, James. Yeah, I actually have something I'm working on that will help this be organized. I can't talk about it yet, but, uh, Good. but yeah, 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 let me know on that. Keep yeah. me in, t in the loop. Okay. All right, James, um, thank you so much for doing this, man. Sincerely, thank you. Uh, you know, trying to get this cylinder uh, to flush out all sides. If someone wants to yeah. come on and, and present something that about critical race theory, Come on, let's. I want to talk about it. Yeah, um, but I love um, that logo too. Yeah. By the way, I, I love that analogy. The you know the shadow from one direction, shadow from the other direction. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. I think we flushed it out. Well, thank you, thank you sincerely, um, and I hope to to keep in touch with you in the future. Absolutely, please do. Cool. All right, man.